welcome all of you, and particularly to highlight our, our dear friends and supporters, uh, Dr. Richard and Dr. Janet Southby. They have been incredible uh, sponsors and supporters of so many wonderful academic and intellectual events here at this school, due both to the generosity of their financial support as well as their mentorship and their time and their experience. It is truly their generosity actually that makes this annual lectureship possible, and we want to thank you for your commitment and your ongoing support of our community in many, many ways. For the past four decades, they have both been leaders here at GW and pioneers truly in the field of public health. Richard South became to GW in 1979 as the chair of the Health Services Management Policy, and then went on to become the dean of our school and founded my department, so it's always a personal thank you for that. <laughs> um, he's held numerous faculty and administrative positions here at GW, and he continues to serve on the Dean's Advisory Council. <coughs> Dr. Janet Southby served in the U.S. Army Nurse Corps for 31 years as Colonel in Chief at the Department of Nursing <coughs> and at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And she currently serves on the School of Nursing Dean's Advisory Council. But truly, as I mentioned, it has been their role as its mentors and friends and leaders that has truly been a gift to our entire community and has made a lasting impact on our, on our school and as well as the entire university. And if you haven't had a chance already, I, I highly recommend that you visit, actually, our wonderful seventh floor conference room, which is named the um, South Bee Conference Room in honor of their various generous contribution. So with that, I'm going to turn to Dean Richard South Bee, who will continue with the welcome remarks. Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Professor Thorpe. I, I really want to uh, just make some very brief comments and say how pleased Janet and I are to have seen this annual lectureship develop and grow and become uh, a very firm fixture within the school. It, it is so good to see so many of my faculty colleagues and friends and, and, uh, and particularly uh, so many students here for the uh, lecture and panel discussion. But I did want to uh, say a special thank you to a number of people uh, particularly to Dean Goldman, who's been a very strong supporter of, of having this uh, uh, lecture each year, uh, to Professor Thorpe for uh, the introduction and welcome this afternoon, and especially this year uh, to uh, Professor Jim Tilch, the Chair of the Department of Global Health, and Professor Ron Waldman, the uh, Professor in the Department of Global Health, because it was really Ron who suggested to me at another program that we were in together that we should try and make this happen for this year's lecture, and I'm so glad that it worked out. We're also very grateful to Professor Sarah Rosenbaum. Sarah, when she was chair of the department, uh, really helped uh, get the annual lectureship established, and, and Sarah, we owe a great deal of gratitude to you for that. And finally, I want to thank uh, Patrick Sanders. Uh, Patrick uh, has done um, most of the work with his colleagues behind the scenes to make all this happen. So Patrick, thank you for everything the work done as well. We are very pleased to have uh, Pam Jeffries with us, the Dean of the School of Nursing, and uh, I'm also delighted that uh, we've got Professor Wendy Broman. Thank you so very much for being willing to do this for us. Thank you. So this is going to be the third in a cascade of introductory comments. <laughs> uh, it just made more sense for uh, Dr. Waldman actually to introduce our speaker today since he knows him so well. Um, so first I want to thank Jan and Richard for their unending uh, contributions here to the school. It's been a real uh, pleasure to have them engaged over many, many years. And um, <coughs> just to remind everybody that the Department of Global Health is now Richard's primary academic home, no longer in his policy and management. <laughs> and we're proud of that and built to steal for people that we you know, respect and, and know well. So I'm going to introduce Ron Waldman. Dr. Waldman is uh, a physician epidemiologist uh, who's been active in the whole humanitarian health world for many, many years. He's a professor here, uh, has been here now for, I think, seven years. Is that right? Yes. About seven, seven, <laughs> seven or eight years. He can't remember either. Uh, this is what happens when you get a little older. Uh, before this, he was at Columbia University where he really founded the program in humanitarian uh, health at Columbia University. And prior to that, he spent many decades uh, as a member of uh, a CDC, although almost never posted, as I understand, to Atlanta. Um, always succumbed it out to WHO or to the Basics Project or to USAID or all sorts of other places around the world. Um, 
and has spent uh, a lot of his career both in the maternal and child health world, in infectious disease, and especially in humanitarian health. So I am going to let Ron take over here and uh, uh, congratulate you on being able to pull this panel <laughs> together. And knowing some of the people on this panel, it's going to be a, a, an interesting job to try to control. And, yeah. <laughs> Good luck for that, Ron. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. I'm going to leave you to introduce somebody. <laughs> Moderate the panel. Um, I think we have more important things to get to today than, than a series of introductions of which I promise everyone this is the last. For now, because later I will take the opportunity to introduce our distinguished panel members as well. But it's really um, uh, a distinct uh, honor and privilege to be able to introduce Ronnie Broman. You know, we in the Department of Global Health were on the brink of launching a new program, a new Masters of Public Health in Humanitarian Health. And I think that before we do that, it's incumbent upon us to ask ourselves the question, what is humanitarian health anyway, and what distinguishes it from other aspects of global health? I'm hoping that Ronnie will make a few remarks that help uh, clarify that. Ronnie Roman is one of those um, people who has extensive field experience in delivering uh, relief to people in need in places around the world. And uh, did that on behalf of, at first, a young organization, Doctors Without Borders or Médecins Sans Frontières. Um, after that, and as the organization grew, and as Ronnie grew through his experiences, Ronnie rose to the rank of president of MSF, which a uh, position in which he served for 12 years. Uh, in doing so, he set the organization to a large extent on the path of growth. I don't mean just financial growth, but especially intellectual growth and reflective growth uh, that it has achieved today. And I think you all have heard of the organization. It's the largest humanitarian organization in the world. I work with a different NGO with a similar name. It's called Médecins du Monde, the Doctors of the World. And having MSF in our field has been really tremendously beneficial because we find in our fundraising efforts that there are a lot of people who confuse <laughs> <laughs> Médecins Sans Frontières and Médecins du Monde. So we benefit a lot from people who make that mistake, and we're very grateful for that as well. Um, as I say, Ronnie began uh, in the field and has a lot of practical experience, but uh, eventually joined the ranks of academia and served on the faculty at Sciences Po, currently at the uh, University of Manchester at the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Unit, the, the Institute. Institute, Humanitarian Conflict Response Institute at the University of Manchester in the UK. He's a really renowned humanitarian intellectual. There is such a category, which it is, and uh, people are uh, in our field are quite familiar with his writings, with his reflections, with his statements, with documentary films that he has made. It's just a tremendous honor uh, for me to be able to introduce Dr. Broman and to um, ask him to make his presentation entitled The Humanitarian Principles flag or compass. Ronnie. themselves as principled organization 
like to speak about principles as a complex. That is, a, a, a set of, of uh, ideas or uh, fundamental uh, issues that help them find their way across a very uh, chaotic uh, environment. And uh, MSF, along with the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, the ICRC, um, uh, are in a way, uh, is in a way leading <coughs> this march, uh, calling upon principles in order to resolve a number of uh, issues. <coughs> I am more than skeptical about this, and uh, one of the reasons uh, why I am more skeptical, more than skeptical, is that during the first, as Ron mentioned, uh, I am an old timer and a humanitarian old timer. I started in 77. And it wasn't until the early 90s that the invocation of hum so called humanitarian principle uh, came. Uh, during, let's say, the, the first 15 years uh, which I spent uh, in the field or at the HQ uh, level doing uh, humanitarian work in various. Uh, approaches, there was no such a thing as a humanitarian principle which would guide which would guide us. Or if there was a humanitarian principle that is something which is absolutely fundamental, something on which you rely uh, in order to construct, to, to, to build up uh, your action, but just the desire to make ourselves useful. <coughs> and this is probably the, the reason why I like very much the definition though I would like to complete it a little bit, but I like very much the definition that Michael Barnett has given of uh, humanitarian uh, assistance, which is alleviating the, the, the goal. Our goal is the alleviation of the suffering of distant strangers. I like this uh, definition because it's uh, very uh, concentrated, it's very... Uh, um, and in every uh, word uh, uh, matters. I will add to this, I'm sure uh, Michael will agree with this, it's not a, it's not a, a physical remark. I will add to that that we, those who do that do not expect any return, any return other than a symbolic, uh, emotional return, of course, that is mm, something else, but uh, it's not about expanding your market, or it's not about uh, uh, pushing your political agenda, it's just about making yourselves useful to people who badly need it. And that is, I mean, the, the, the core principle, that is what brings us together. That is what gives us energy uh, to overcome some uh, uh, obstacles. Certainly not the idea of being neutral, independent, or impartial, uh, which is the, the holy uh, trio uh, that is uh, regularly uh, invoked and which I consider rather a kind of totem or a sacred cow, that's something which is really useful uh, in the, for, uh, for us uh, in the course, I mean, to find the right course of action. So having said that, uh, <coughs> I should add straight away that it's not only a kind of uh, an aesthetic uh, <coughs> approach to the problem. <coughs> okay, in the past we don't involve this humanitarian principle, then more recently uh, it became a habit to, to invoke it, and after all, what is the problem? past is not necessarily better than the present, and so it's not, uh, it's not enough. Uh, and now my point uh, is to <coughs> explain why, in fact, it may turn out, it may turn out, it's not systematically the case, but it may easily turn out to be detrimental to uh <coughs> acting uh, for uh, those who are uh, in uh, dire need. Uh, for instance, lately, during the siege in Mosul, um, MSF, MSF as a whole, you know, MSF has five operational sections, so five operational sections agreed that they should not respond uh, positively to the appeal launched by WHO in order to form a coalition of the willing, uh, uh, of the humanitarian willing, in order to rescue uh, those who survived the siege of uh, 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 Mosul. Why was this decision taken? Well, it was taken in the name of the preservation of uh, our principles of independence and neutrality. It was being signing along with the UN, which was part of the assault launched against uh, Mosul, 
was a way to take sides in a conflict than to jeopardize our principle of uh, neutrality. And in doing so, we decided that the principles were more important than the life of uh, human beings. We bolstered the principles at the cost of doing something really uh, uh, significant, meaningful for those who were uh, able to escape the siege of uh, Mosul. And the same goes for a number of other situations, like for instance, when the NSF or similar uh, <coughs> organization refused to go uh, to, to use a helicopter uh, with the colors of the United Nations, Libya, or Congo, or to be conflated with uh, UN cars uh, because the UN is part of the conflict in DR Congo, or to use a military convoy uh, in northeastern Nigeria, where it is the only way to access uh, a besieged area where people are just starving to death, but which can people who can be helped out uh, on, the, on the condition that we use uh, uh, military uh, protection to get there. Uh, so my <coughs> point might uh, seem to be uh, uh, to, to be an argument for a pragmatic approach against a, a principle. Uh, <coughs> uh, I would not accept this uh, qualification. I'm not a big fan of uh, uh, pragmatist uh, uh, approach for a variety of uh, reasons. I think it's uh, a principled approach, which is that we need we our raison d'être is to make ourselves useful to people who badly uh, need it. This is a principle. And I oppose this principle to ethical, juridical principles that don't really uh, apply uh, uh, to us. And this is my third point. Uh, humanitarian, or let's say fundamental principle, as they were called in the first place by those who, like Jean Pictet, and uh, who in, in the name of uh, the Red Cross set this uh, put in place this set of uh, <coughs> uh, principles that they were done for the Red Cross. And the Red Cross has a number of things, at first, has a number of issues to deal with which are completely different from the issues we are dealing with. First off, the Red Cross has a long history and a problematic record uh, that sometimes uh, it uh, uh, tries to erase or at least to bury under a, a number of uh, and this is not a critique on the Red Cross. I've got a lot of respect for the international community of the, of the Red Cross. It's just that it's an old organization which has come across extremely difficult situation. And of course, when I had in mind the Second World War and the, the, the coexistence of the, of the Red Cross and the Nazis. <coughs> so that is one, one of the points. But another point is that uh, the Red Cross has established, and this is, this is, this is part of its mission, uh, uh, national societies of Red Cross, which are considered and, and which are by status, uh, <coughs> by its bylaws, uh, auxiliaries to the uh, public authorities. Uh, so it is quite understandable that uh, they uh, want to claim that they are independent, since they are not independent. They are auxiliaries of uh, the, the, the local states or uh, public uh, uh, authorities. Uh, the Red Cross as a whole, whether the International Committee, but rather the National Society of Red Cross, have been involved in uh, uh, colonial conquest, have been involved in imperial uh, adventures, have been involved in, uh, in uh, national, uh, national wars, and they have a lot uh, to be uh, forsaken about. In my view, this is why in 1965, they decided that uh, World Conference to adopt uh, these fundamental uh, principles, which in a way play the role of a shield against the comeback of, uh, of history or another uh, uh, certain number of uh, misadventures. Okay, fair enough. I'm not judging this. Uh, the Red Cross has its logics, uh, it has its special status, it has a special role, uh, the division of labor between the International Committee of the Red Cross and the League, now the Federation of the Red Cross and the National Society, is a, is a whole world in itself. It is a juridical category, it is a political category, and, I, and of course it's a humanitarian organization, but due to its 
very specific uh, characteristics. I don't think that the way it is portraying itself, the fundamental, the, the, the principle that it sets for itself should be exported out of its specific uh, uh, domain. But this is what happened. The fascination for the international community of the Red Cross, the, the influence this very uh, impressive organization exerts over uh, the humanitarian uh, uh, community, over the humanitarian in the industry as a whole, <coughs> has had this effect that most NGOs think that what is good for the, for the international community of the Red Cross is good for them. Uh, neutrality, independence, impartiality uh, to focus on the main uh, on the main ones and there again <coughs> this is some kind of uh, religion uh, uh, coming back to the holy tree you have, you know, for someone who is not Christian which is my case you know in the name of independence neutrality and impartiality uh, that is something really, uh, really a bit weird for me at least a bit uh, well I can make a mockery uh, uh, out of it but now comes my last point uh, which is uh, to, to uh, try and share with you the notion that the, these notions are, are completely are rather uh, empty. That is, you fill them with what you have. Uh, they no longer have a content uh, in themselves. Uh, neutrality, uh, uh, for instance. Historically speaking, neutrality means that uh, it, it applies, of course, in the context of uh, war, of uh, military uh, confrontation. Uh, a patient that is uh, a combatant who is sick or uh, wounded, who is put out of combat, becomes neutral. He is in a way subtracted from the rest of the combatants and uh, given back to humanity and uh, considered deserving a human uh, treatment. Uh, that is uh, what Neutrality is all about, at least in the first place, when it was uh, imported in the humanitarian field. I want to elaborate on the, 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 the political history of neutrality, which is a state uh, concept, of course, uh, but uh, that I will elaborate uh, uh, on this. Now, neutrality in its uh, contemporary, uh, in, in its uh, actual uh, definition, is uh, uh, something else. And by the way, I think it is regrettable that the original meaning of this uh, notion be uh, forgotten because it's interesting to say that someone who is not able to combat is considered just a human being as any other human being and not uh, as a, a person who has occupied a certain side in the inner confrontation. Anyway, that's how it is, so let's not uh, shed tears about, uh, uh, about it. But neutrality is, has become a very problematic the notion, in fact, historically speaking, as far as I'm concerned, the most problematic, the, the first one, which really uh, made me think, well, I don't want this. I don't want this for me. I don't feel I've recognized myself. I can project myself uh, in this. It is, uh, in times of war, not taking sides and not being part of the conflict, okay, not supporting the intelligence on a web supply of munition or whatever. So that perfectly fine. I feel perfectly comfortable with, with this. But uh, humanitarian aid in, in war settings is only a very limited part of what humanitarian organizations do in general. Maybe for MSF it might be like uh, one third, uh, 30 to 40 percent uh, no more. And for most organizations, it's much lower. Anyway, even for MSF, which is well, which is renowned for its indication in a war setting, it's a minority of uh, actually real war context. I'm not talking about IDPs or, or, or uh, refugee camps, etc. I'm talking about what we do in terms of war for war wounded, etc. Uh, okay, not taking sides uh, is fine. Now, in terms of peace, neutrality exists as well. Mm. And it's about not taking, not, not, not taking part in public controversies, whether they be uh, political, religious, philosophical, or racial. That means that, uh, for instance, uh, someone who holds a racist discourse and someone who holds an anti-racist discourse has the same status in the view of humanitarian uh, uh, agent. Let's, let's think of, a, let's say, a Burmese who think that Rohingyas uh, are 
not just human beings who deserve to be considered human beings in their own uh, country. This guy would be considered a non-humanitarian to the eyes of those who think that you need to be neutral in order to be humanitarian. Uh, neutrality can, be, can, can run against the <coughs> principle of, uh, the fundamental principle of uh, humanitarianism. Rohingyas are considered non-human or just aliens who need to be uh, pushed out of the, of the country. A Burmese, a Buddhist, a Buddhist Burmese, a Burmese would say, no, this is not right, this is not fair, it would be considered as taking part in a public controversy than being uh, not uh, uh, neutral. And we could give a number of uh, other uh, examples, I mean, Charles Philippe, the Nazis, and the anti Nazis just uh, uh, occupied the same, same statistics. But there are good people in both sides, and uh, who needs to bother about who, who thinks what? So this is about a literary, it's just, it's just, maybe for, for the, for the ICRC, once again, who has, which has a very special status, I mean, the, the head of delegation of the ICRC have a diplomatic status, they travel with a diplomatic passport, they are part of the political uh, uh, community, and <coughs> entrusted with the task of uh, enforcing, or at least promoting, uh, humanitarian laws uh, as part of the, as an official mission. So I'm not disputing that they are bound by a certain set of obligations, including neutrality. And after all, they keep silent, they remain silent, it's their own business. But the problem comes when we, being not diplomats, being not uh, entrusted with a certain uh, mission, being self-mandated, just uh, take up this obligation as if it was just a natural obligation uh, uh, related to our specific uh, goals that are uh, humanitarian. This is a lack of reflection uh, which I think is quite uh, uh, regrettable. <coughs> now there is a second uh, principle. Uh, uh, my, uh, if I'm too long, please. Uh, <coughs> there is a second uh, uh, principle which I think, and that was for quite a long time, uh, uh, a very intimate uh, conviction which, which, which lies at the core of uh, anyone who wants to help in a humanitarian way, which is impartiality. And I would say, I, I think I would take this notion more seriously than uh, uh, neutrality, to be uh, uh, completely uh, honest. What does impartiality mean? Let's, let's uh, note uh, first, firstly that uh, the meaning of this word differs in the humanitarian world from what it means uh, in the ordinary uh, world. Uh, impartiality in the ordinary world means being neutral. You don't take sides. This is what uh, it means. In the in, uh, uh, humanitarian world, I don't know exactly why this should uh, require I mean, some kind of uh, lexicological uh, research or semantic research. It means fairness or proportionality. It would be better named uh, principle of proportionality. That is, if you have two sides, you don't, think, you don't give half you have in terms of services or goods uh, to one side and uh, the rest to the other. You give in proportion to the needs. It means that it's a principle of discrimination. Um, and I must say, I would, uh, I would uh, fail uh, my environment again, but it's not entirely responsible for this, but I give you the credit for hosting this chapter. I mean, in the uh, humanitarian in, in question, uh, the book that was written by Michael and Thomas Weiss, uh, 10 years ago, more or less, I don't remember exactly. There's a chapter written by <coughs> Jennifer Rubinstein about the distributive commitments of international NGOs. And um, for those who are interested in reflection about uh, humanitarian issues in, in general, I would advise them to read and to study uh, this chapter, which is probably, in my view, the most important reading I've ever had in this uh, uh, domain, at least uh, during the past, let's say, uh, 20 years. For me, there is before and after reading this, uh, this outstanding uh, uh, chapter, even the title. Is very enlightening. Distributive commitments of international NGOs. We're not talking about principles, about morality, no. 
engagement, commitments to distribute goods and, and, and services. And she describes it in an incredibly practical way. Well, she's a philosopher, but she does the best of philosophy, that is to help us think about what we do without even thinking about it. And uh, this is what this chapter uh, is, uh, is all about. And something I'm impressed about, and I'm never mind. Um, I won't elaborate too, 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 too much on it. I just want to, to say that impartiality means acting uh, in, in order to respond to the needs. But what do we mean by this, for, for instance, is a utilitarian approach like uh, uh, maximizing uh, reduction of harm, uh, uh, that is how she defines a uh, utilitarian uh, approach, is it a way to respond to it? Yes, of course, it's, it's a way. But then you can, you can adopt another uh, approach, which is uh, addressing the most urgent needs. So uh, uh, you'll be a better off you if you address the urgent need. For instance, in Syria, NSF does a war surgery, or used to do a war surgery before we were kidnapped and had to go out and uh, now uh, we're doing our action there through only remote uh, action, so we don't have exactly teams uh, on the ground. But still, uh, our focus were uh, the war wounded, but in fact the population uh, didn't think that the war uh, injuries were the, the, had to be the priority. For them, the priority was high blood pressure, cancer treatment, follow up of uh, 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 pregnant uh, uh, women. I mean, the ordinary access to healthcare that was interrupted due to due to the war, and that which had to be rehabilitated, which had to, which had to be re re reinstalled. That was the priority of the population. But we, as a humanitarian emergency humanitarian organization, wanted to focus on war surgery. And of course, it was useful I mean, for those who are wounded, and not only the combatants, of course, but the uh, people in in general who find themselves uh, injured. They they are quite happy to. But you don't make you you not make every, everybody happy because there is a kind of bottleneck. Uh, there is a limit to what you can do in, in financial terms, but also in security terms. Uh, in, in, in practical terms, in, uh, in general. So you've got to make choices. And who can decide that uh, this choice is better than uh, another choice? Uh, it's, a, it's a moral charity, if I may say so. And we decide because we think that we are good people and we act um, uh, sincerely and we want to make ourselves useful. We think that our choices are good, but they are disputable. They are subject to uh, to uh, 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 debate. And for instance, we had an argument with the ICRC in Syria. Uh, MSF claiming that uh, it was uh, uh, conducting the, uh, a real impartial action, the, whereas uh, uh, the ICRC was taking sides because they had decided to, to be present in the government controlled uh, areas. And <coughs> to sort of uh, irrigate the rest of the country, uh, starting from the government control, from starting from Damascus, uh, basically. And we, uh, and MSF said to the ICRC, you're, in the, you're playing into the hands of the Damascus uh, regime, and you can hardly reach out to the Jews who uh, most, mostly uh, need uh, your uh, assistance. And they could respond to us that, well, we have taken side with the rebellion, and that we can hardly reach out to those who are living under the government uh, control. Of course, you've got more people in need in the rebellion control areas for, for obvious reasons, but you have many people who will need assistance due to the, 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 the conflict uh, in government uh, control uh, areas. So each one is claiming for itself uh, the, the, the respect for the notion of uh, neutrality and uh, impartiality and accusing or criticizing the other side uh, to, to, to betray uh, the, the, these uh, principles. In fact, both, both are right. Uh, it's not that I want to reconcile both positions. I don't care about the, I mean, the conflict. This can be a very productive uh, uh, thing. It's just that the notion of impartiality doesn't lend itself to this kind of uh, divi di dividing uh, uh, line. They both are right because they the, 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 at the end of the day, MSF, just as the RCRC, 
do what they can uh, do what in uh, what is in their uh, reach. <coughs> and we're not almighty, we're not God, uh, we just do what is uh, left uh, for us uh, to do. SRC with specific mandate have to, have to move to another place in Damascus and they're trying, they're trying their best to uh, to turn their uh, <coughs> goods and, and, and services sort of trickle down and, and move across the, the, the front line <coughs> and, <coughs> and reach out to those uh, on the other side of the uh, front line. And basically, as I said, was not accepted in the, on the, in the government side for the reason which I don't know, but the Damascus regime never accepted any of the sections of, uh, of MSF. So we were forced uh, to work only in the rebellion controlled uh, areas. And this uh, position uh, eventually uh, got used as a kind of moral stance. Uh, we are on the side of those who are the worst off. And then we are trying our best to do uh, better, to improve their, uh, their situation. But this, is, this has nothing to do with ethics. This has nothing to do with physical It has everything to do with what we can do in practice on the ground. And uh, then we managed to, to find uh, 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 our way. And then I'll finish with the, the principle, the third principle uh, of the Holy, Holy Tria, which is the principle of independence. Uh, no one on earth is independent. Uh, we are all dependent on the variety of things uh, to our family, to our society, to our ancestors to our to to, to those who uh, impose uh, enforce the law, uh, etc. When we work in a certain country, uh, we work under an authority, whether it's an official authority, the government and administration, or a private or, or a private, or let's say, uh, 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 non-legal uh, authority, just as a guerrilla group, uh, uh, an opposition, armed opposition uh, a group. If they don't accept us, then we're done. We cannot work. Uh, so uh, we need to negotiate with those authorities uh, in order to find a, a common ground between them and, and, uh, and us. A common ground means that we have to be of interest to their eyes. That is, to use a word which is considered a bad word in the humanitarian industry, we need to be instrumentalized by those who will accept us. If they can't instrumentalize us, then we are of no interest and nobody will be able to spell out the reason why they would accept us. So instrumentalization is not a, a negative side effect of uh, humanitarian aid. It's a condition for humanitarian aid to exist in certain settings. <coughs> Having said that, the, what we need to uh, check, and this applies as well to the notion of neutrality, and uh, independence is kind of cross-cutting uh, uh, issue. We need to verify whom we are serving first. Are we serving the interest of the uh, authorities, or are we serving the interest of the people we want to, uh, to serve? This is something which is not easy because we don't have, uh, we don't have an instrument to measure uh, the interest and uh, to measure the, the, the services that we are uh, rendering. But I won't elaborate on this, but I want just, just want to, to mention this is a notion which I've worked on, which is the notion of humanitarian space. <coughs> it's not a geographic, uh, geographical uh, notion, it's not a physical notion, it's a, it's a symbolic uh, notion. Humanitarian space <coughs> is a way for me to three, uh, three landmarks, which is uh, the ability to speak freely with the people, the ability to monitor the goods and services that you rendering with the ability to reassess a situation. Okay, two minutes, all right. It's okay. <laughs> and this uh, uh, notion is a dynamic notion. It's not a photograph, it's a film. We've got to follow up on this, its uh, evolution. If it goes down, if it shrinks, that means that humanitarian space is diminishing, that you're becoming more and more, in the, playing more and more in the hands of the authority and less and less in favor of the population. The opposite, it works the other way. Uh, uh, so 
my point here is that we have a we have a possibility to assess the role that we are playing in certain uh, situations. That is what is at, at play when we work in a very charged, in a very uh, politically loaded uh, uh, situation, such as a military confrontation or a full, full fledged uh, uh, war. So, uh, uh, to sum it up, uh, these three uh, notions are widely spread, widely accepted as the markers of humanitarian aid. And this is probably the main reason why I might, I'm not suggesting to just uh, jettison those uh, principles to get rid to get rid of them, but to have a very limited use uh, of them. And this is where I come with my notion of flag. Let's agitate the flag. Let's let's signal ourselves with the notion that we are neutral, impartial, independent in one word. No matter what, no matter the meaning we, we put, no matter the, the content, it's just that the meaning, the fundamental meaning is that we don't have enemies. We don't consider anyone uh, as an, as an uh, uh, enemy. Everyone is human being and we, we're here to help. Maybe not at the same level, we have priorities, but we don't want to be considered uh, as enemies. Of course, some people have a knife. <laughs> I know very well that some people we consider us. As, uh, and I'm speaking of Daesh and this kind of ideas, uh, this kind of, of books, of course. But we, as a humanitarian organization, declare, we state clearly that we don't have uh, enemies and that all we want is to make ourselves useful to populate to people who uh, badly uh, uh, need. So this is the reason why I think that we've got to, not to stick to this uh, principle, but to retain them as a kind of uh, business card, as a kind of brand, as a kind of uh, uh, general uh, marker of, as I said, uh, a flag which says something about our intentions, positively and negatively. Positively, we want to help. Negatively, uh, we, want to, we don't want to do any harm to anyone uh, in this uh, area. And this is where we start. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ryan, for your um, intelligent and incisive and, as we expected, somewhat provocative remarks. I mentioned earlier that the Department of Global Health is uh, beginning a Master's in Public Health program in humanitarian health. Uh, we hope to be working closely with CRASH, the Center for Reflection at MSF, so we hope to be seeing a lot of you either in person or on Skype, Zoom, or any of those other things that uh, will help us out considering. More environmental friendly. Uh, thanks for sure, right. Lower carbon load. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Uh, we're going to have a panel to discuss uh, aspects of um, the remarks that we just heard. Can I invite the panelists to take your place? Ronnie, why don't you sit in the middle here? I'm going to keep introductions of the panelists uh, very, very short. We have Professor Michael Barnett from the Elliott School here at GW, who is a known <coughs> historian and practitioner as well of humanitarian affairs. Uh, Ramin Asghari, a pro uh, associate professor of global health in our department, who has done who has done uh, numerous missions on behalf of Médecins Sans Frontières uh, in various places and on various subjects, and who's the director of the new MPH program, and who has been, until recently, a member of the board of directors of Doctors Without Borders USA. Um, Rosa Solaria, uh, lawyer, who um, is at the, uh, in a, Assistant Dean? Associate. Associate Dean, sorry. Associate Dean at the School of Law here at GW, but who is an expert in human rights law and who comes from uh, the Inter-American Commission, where, whatever it's called, the, the Inter-American Commission. Okay. Yes. Inter Commission. <laughs> Have people introduce themselves, rather, and uh, they do a much better job, I find. Um, with the exception of Mike Toole, who uh, I know well enough since we have been working together for the past 40 years or so, having met in Somalia in 1980, 
Uh, Mike had a long and quite distinguished career at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where he is really instrumental for getting them into the um, business of uh, helping uh, clarify the epidemiology of refugee health and the health of others affected by um, conflict and other kinds of humanitarian settings. Mike comes to us from the Burnett Institute in Melbourne, Australia. So welcome to all of you. I don't have any um, prepared questions necessarily, but I thought we would start with you, Michael Barnett. Um, <laughs> to bring a humanitarian, you, you, you study carefully the humanitarian principles, you have written about them, and I was wondering how you react to Ronnie's remarks and how you place them in historical context. Okay, well, uh, first off, I, it's just, it's a real honor and privilege to be here. I, it, it's, uh, I, I feel a little daunted because, in, in fact, I think it's fair to say that a lot I've learned about the humanitarian principles have been, you know, reading uh, <laughs> Ronnie over the years, so, if what I say sounds familiar, if, if that's the reason. Um, but I don't agree with everything, uh, so is that, is that what you're for? So I just want to say, uh, I, I guess a couple of things that, uh, that you alluded to. One is that uh, humanitarianism existed long before these principles. And that's important to keep in mind. And partly it's because if you go to a lot of the websites of some of the major humanitarian or aid organizations, they actually will define what humanitarian is, is in relationship to these principles. Even though, like Save the Children and so many, they, they pre-existed the principles. And so it's worth thinking, I mean, just sort of, sort of teasing out just for a moment then, sort of why do these principles emerge when they did? Uh, and I think, you know, there's the 1965 for ICRC, but they kind of spread within the humanitarian world really in the 1990s. And I think it's largely because of you know, three things that were going on. One was that there were all these so-called new wars in which uh, you, know, you, were no long, you were increasingly on the front lines, which created a whole new set of demands and problems for emergency operations. Uh, there was also uh, something that, you, there was a, actually a growing marketplace of of organizations that wanted to provide aid, some of which were professional, but a lot of them were kind of, I don't want to say they were ambulance chasers, uh, but they were probably, they were amateurs. And that posed a problem not only for other aid agencies, but also for the victims on the ground. And the third was the growing role of states. Uh, that was, you know, there had been a growing role of states in humanitarian action over the century, but I really do think the end of the Cold War, beginning of the, uh, of the post Cold War period, was the moment that states really not only became prominent, but also became commanding of, of a lot of the aid world. And so I think that's the context. And so, you know, for me, a lot of the reasons to sort of ask this is because these principles came of age to serve a particular function, I think. You know, they, and and the function was several fold. One, you know, something that, uh, you know, that I, I do think is important is this question of access. And it's central. And I think for a lot of aid agencies, the, it wasn't so much that they believed that they were, I think, neutral and partial and independent, but they felt like this was something of a confidence trick that if they actually said they were, then others would believe it. And so they would be able to get access to populations at risk uh, in conditions that they otherwise wouldn't. Uh, it also, I thought, you know, served another function, something that, that wasn't mentioned, which is, uh, to the, and this is in some ways related to the humanitarian space, which is that we're apolitical. Uh, we're not there to change anything in terms of politics. We're just saving lives, not just, but we are saving lives, and we don't have any long-term goals. We're not trying to create democracies, we're not trying to do human rights, we're not trying to do this, that, and the other, we're just trying to save lives, so we're outside of politics. So actually don't confuse us then with these democracy promotion organizations or these human rights organizations or these development organizations, which often do have larger ambitions and which are often about then sort of taking power away from existing elites, uh, which can always get you in trouble. The, the third, I, I think, was that this was a way of asserting autonomy. 
that this was actually a moment when humanitarianism was becoming you know, something of a field it was becoming something that people sort of understood that there were rules and codes of conduct and right ways and wrong ways to do things. And it was a way of saying that we've got an expertise. Uh, MSF was one of the ones that I think helped to pioneer this in terms of emergency medicine in the field. And, and so that gave it a fair bit of authority, which I don't think they wanted, many organizations didn't want to lose to uh, rivals. So, you know, for me, part of it is, you know, always asking these questions, if these principles have emerged at a particular time, who benefits from it? Uh, what are the organizations that need it? What are they intended to serve? And so, and, and that's my sense of the setting in the 1990s. The big question that I think, you know, that, that I think Ronnie poses now is, uh, are, do these, are these principles functional or dysfunctional? You know, are they still, you know, do they serve that original purpose even if they, even if they weren't quite great? Uh, but have we got to a point where these principles are fundamentally dysfunctional? And that's something that I think, you know, people have been asking in one way or another for, for quite some time. I'm, I'm very intrigued by the notion of this is not as a compass but as a flag. And let me just sort of add just <laughs> one, one small remark there. Uh, and the reason why not a compass is because I think if you actually, you know, I, 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 not, I just learned this second and third hand from others, is that if you go back and look at how, field, how operations work in the field, uh, the principles are sort of there, but they don't really do a lot of guidance. Uh, it's not as if you can actually say, here are the principles, so here's what we'll do. In fact, I think they're actually more like, and this is why I was sort of intrigued by the notion of proportionality, in international humanitarian law, the notion of proportionality. Michael Walzer makes this very important argument, I think, that no one actually can measure proportionality. You can never, you know, and it's always forward looking, it's not backward looking. And what proportionality is designed to do is basically make, keep people honest. In this case, keep, keep generals honest so that when they think about civilian casualties, they're always waiting to get military necessity. But it's not that they can ever measure it and say, yes, it's worth the civilian casualty, but they have to stop and think. And I think in many ways that's what the principles, you know, I, I, I take the point of a flag in many ways as saying we're not beholden to it, but these are things that are going to guide us more loosely, but not be, but not be a slave to them. So let me, uh, let me, end there, um, lots of other comments, but thank you, that was provocative in, in, in every which way. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. You, um, you mentioned that you learned a lot from reading uh, Ronnie's work, so I think it's uh, a necessity that I help Ronnie sell more books. <laughs> it's part of the reason that he's here. So I would refer everyone to Ronnie's latest work, which is available around, including on Amazon, which is called Humanitarian Wars, Lies, and Brainwashing. Um, it's going to be available it's going to be on the shelves in June. Yeah, yeah. on the shelves in you June. Can pre -order you can pre-order now on I did. Amazon. I have a copy for you. Yeah, grab a copy for you. You can have your order. Tell, see if you can get your money back from Mr. Bezos. Sure, Ronnie, go ahead. About, about the important issue that you've raised, but are these uh, principles of Functional or uh, dysfunctional. Uh, in my view, this is not the way, <coughs> and this is what uh, I want to, to respond to this particular uh, point. In my view, uh, a flag is not functional or dysfunctional. It depends on what you expect from a flag, just as a screwdriver is functional to screw, to screw, uh, to drive a screw, but not to operate on uh, to have surgery. Uh, this is the same kind of, uh, this is the same kind of thing. So, these principles are functional uh, as long as we use them to distinguish ourselves from other entities which provide aid in, uh, in general. We do it in, in a certain way and we want, to, we want this to be known. In, in this, a flag is functional, but the principles cannot be considered, in my view, functional or dysfunctional. I just wanted to bring up that uh, you know, when we're talking, as we have to, when we talk about the principles, we also put them in the context of the Geneva Conventions and the rest of international humanitarian law. 
Uh, I just wanted, we were talking earlier, and um, I said that uh, a colleague of mine had made a point to me recently that international humanitarian law, although many in the, human, in the NGO <coughs> community may think so, th these are not pacifist documents or pacifist principles at all. They teach us how to conduct war, recognizing that war exists. They're kind of the rules of war. They're not the rules of how to stop wars, avoid wars, prevent wars, or anything else. But they do refer to war. So Dean Solario, I wanted to ask you um, to talk about that a little bit, but also to put it in the context, as I'm doing some work now that has been very revealing to me, that when you, when you consider what's happening in the world today, outside of Syria, the most violent countries in the world, by which I mean more people die of violence than of other causes of death, are not countries that are at war. They're the Central American countries of Honduras, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. And I wonder if you could try to tell us if there's any relevance either of international humanitarian law or of the humanitarian principles in regard to that situation as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Wallman, and also for inviting me to be here. It's very okay. daunting for me as well. It's, it's wonderful to be at the public health school. It's been an honor to hear you speak. Thank you so much for uh, welcoming me uh, to this event. And um, I must say, for me, this is an absolutely <coughs> fascinating discussion. As Dr. Wallman said, before entering academia full time, I was actually a human rights lawyer for almost 20 years, working in different contexts around the world. And there were many contexts in which I was working in that you can qualify as contexts that needed humanitarian aid or needed a humanitarian lens and were contexts where there were um, extensive levels of assistance being received, but many other contexts in which that rubric didn't fit in, that category didn't fit in, um, but we have to give this human, human rights approach as well, as well as the humanitarian approach. And there's a few things that I wanted to say building on Dr. Wallman's questions and also the wonderful lecture we just had. I think when you're a human rights lawyer, um, principles are very important for different reasons. I've worked in my career with many governments, um, and I still work with a lot of governments. I'm not only an associate dean, but I'm also a lecturer, and I still do a lot of research on human rights issues. Um, I work with a lot of governments and non-state actors, and more often than not, the main question that they have is what guides me, what's my compass, what's my flag, right? If I'm gonna receive humanitarian aid, what should be the principles that guide this? If I'm actually gonna implement human rights obligations, what is the content of those? So I'm usually very, um, and give a lot of emphasis to any sort of like guidelines or principles of content because I'm usually the recipient of questions when it comes to that. So, and this kind of goes to your pragmatic approach. I think it's very important to look at these issues not only from a legal approach, but also a very pragmatic approach and what happens on the ground and different actors involved. Um, and I think the question of effectiveness is very important as well. Um, we're not only talking about satisfying or saving lives in humanitarian emergencies. More often than not, we're also talking about the structural, the long term. What are we gonna do with these societies after we leave? And, and I always uh, propose and suggest that I know we're talking about humanitarian aid, and I know that there are specific principles like neutrality, independence, and impartiality, but we're not only talking about emergencies, we're talking about societies that we are trying to build. So I've always been a big proponent of this integrality between humanitarian principles and also human rights obligations. And one of the reasons why I propose that integrality too is because you have so much acceptance worldwide of human rights obligations by governments. These are not effectively implemented in any place in the world. We have tremendous enforcement problems, but I haven't met with one single government around the world yet that doesn't accept the fact that they have human rights obligations. This is very well known language, and it's language that they're using for legislation, for public policies, for programs, for services. We have a lot of enforcement issues, but it's language that takes less convincing at this so I think it's very important to keep on using it. There's other, piece, there's other things that I wanted to say, and for me this is a challenge actually as a thinker in this area. For me sometimes it's very difficult to reconcile human rights with humanitarian aid and the principles. 
the reality is that I understand the principle of neutrality, but in human rights, it's very difficult not to be, it's very difficult to be neutral. You often have to take sides. The reality is that human rights are supposed to be for all. They're supposed to be universal, they're interdependent. I mean, those are these wonderful aspirations that have been codified in many instruments. But when you look around you, the reality is that we're often taking decisions. When I worked at the Organization of American States on the Human Rights Commission, we were always taking decisions. We were all always advocating for democratic regimes. We were always advocating for less repressive regimes. Um, we were ab big advocates um, against discrimination for inclusive societies, uh, for societies that were ruled by peace. We were taking sides, and often in contexts that had humanitarian needs as well. And I wanted to respond to Dr. Walmart's question because we were having a discussion about this yesterday and it really made me think about Central America in particular. The reality is that the Northern Triangle and the countries in Central America are some of the most violent in the world. This is why we have these high numbers of internal displacement, immigration, deaths, killings, violence against women, um, violation of children's rights, and a number of human rights violations. And what's really interesting about the Central American context is that we need human rights in the sense that we're trying to transform these societies. We're trying to transform these societies from a post-conflict context to an actual functioning democratic system free of corruption um, with legit, legitimate institutions and other of the pillars that we have in human rights. But there's also a lot of humanitarian needs. The reality is that a lot of the violence is creating humanitarian need, but this is not necessarily a situation that fits the rubric uh, of humanitarian assistance. These are considered post-conflict societies. My question is, if we are talking about human beings, if we are talking about alleviating human suffering, there's a lot of terminology that was mentioned this morning that for me is very, very important here. Um, then why do we really need to be in a specific unconflict context? Why are we supposed to be fitting specific definitions to be able to meet these humanitarian needs? And another thing that I want to add, because we're in a public health school, is that um, it's difficult for me not to think of the big obligations identified in international human rights law when it comes to health services, which is a big component um, of any humanitarian space. We're talking about Affordability, affordability, quality. Um, there's a lot of words that we use. This have, this have been used by the United Nations, by the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and other bodies. Um, how is how are the principles related to this? Do they give content to this? Um, I don't think they should be treated separately. And I know this sounds a bit provocative, but I think it's precisely what we should be thinking about right now, especially if we're thinking of a pragmatic approach or an approach that really considers these principles and at least to be in a space where the principles are not necessarily dysfunctional, but at least we can use them. For me, the usage of the principles is very important as well um, to analyze. But I'm gonna stop there because I've spoken too much. Thank you. And it was wonderful to hear you as well. <laughs> Thank you, Rosa. Thank you very much for those insights. Mike, I'm gonna to turn to you. You've worked in some situations that uh, are amongst the worst imaginable starting with the consequences of the Cambodian genocide. Uh, you worked with refugees from the Rwanda genocide 25 years ago. You worked in the Balkans in close association with the Srebrenica massacre. Yet medical ethics and who we take care of in administering medical relief and humanitarian assistance are different from the kinds of um, uh, consequences that uh, we dole out to people who we deem to be war criminals or committed crimes of war. And, and I wonder if you could just maybe think a little bit about um, the, the connection or the disconnect between those two fields of work. When we talked about, uh, when, when we dealt with um, survivors or people with cholera in the wake of the Rwanda genocide, for example, the medical history was not for how many days have you been having diarrhea? Uh, do, have you had a fever? Are you vomiting? Did you participate in genocidal activities? We left off that last one out of respect for the principles of neutrality and the other things we've been talking about today. I wonder if you have any reflections on that. Um, 
Well, I think, well, first of all, I should say, um, well, I met Ron in 1980 in Somali. I met Ronnie in 1977 on the Thai Cambodian border. So, so you're, you're even older than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, first thing I would say is that medical ethics are universal, and you know, there are no circumstances where medical ethics are no longer relevant. They are always relevant like human rights are always relevant, whether it's wartime or peacetime. Um, however, the way in which we um, approach our patients, I'll put that in a broad sense, um, it has to be because of circumstances quite different and therefore can sometimes push the, the boundaries of what we normally consider an ethical medical practice. Um, so in a cholera epidemic, and I was there as were you in 1994 in the camps for Rwandan refugees, there was almost a tendency to treat people like cattle. There, there really humanly was hardly any alternative. There just weren't enough health workers, there certainly weren't enough experienced health workers. Um, so the ethics of you know, autonomy and, and treating a patient as an individual were really very difficult to um, to uh, implement. A film that Ronnie, um, I guess, conceived, didn't direct, but you conceived it. He wrote it. He wrote it. has a dreadful last scene in it where some, I think, French journalists were going through a crowd of people lying out on the grass um, with intravenous drips, so we all cholera. And these journalists found, uh, no, no, they went over to where the, the dead bodies were mm -hmm. and found a child that was alive. Mm -hmm. Is that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was a doctor from the Oh, okay. Oh, not a journalist, mm -hmm. a doctor. They found this boy had been abandoned as dead. So clearly the normal ethics of managing sick people was just very difficult to implement. But again, there should be a flag that maybe has medical ethics as the fourth part of the quadrangle, or what's, what's the <laughs> equivalent of a triad. Um, there are lots of other ethical issues that arise, um, you know, in, in for example, in the, the management of tuberculosis, there's a whole lot of different issues that need to be addressed, one of which is, is my patient going to be here for long enough for me to treat them for six months? And if not, are they going to be able to continue their care somewhere else? Or else are they going to develop resistance? And are they going to spread that resistance to other people? So the normal way that we would manage as clinicians a TB patient is perhaps a little bit more complicated. And then that pushes against the ethics of this person that is sick, has a particular disease, you have to treat them according to best practice. Um, so I'll stop there on ethics. I did want to <coughs> ask one other question that relates to NSF's approach to neutrality. In the 1980s and 90s, NSF developed a strategy that was a little bit different, for example, from the neutrality practice by the ICRC. And at least in the French section was called témoignage, or witnessing. And it became a very important part of being, um, of working for MSF. From every orientation and briefing would talk about your responsibility for témoignage, and that is, if in the course of your work, <coughs> delivering health services or water and sanitation, you observe um, an action, an abuse um, that basically contravenes basic human rights, then you have a responsibility for sharing that information. Now, of course, there are huge challenges in how you do that and don't put yourself at risk. Um, but I'd, last, I'd like to ask Ronnie he reflects back over the last 20, 30 years, you know, 
how effective do you think Kimonyanaj has been? Because it, in a way, it's, it's you know it's non-neutral. It's reporting and abuse, but of course it could be by that side, it could be by this side. So it's not actually taking sides in the conflict, but taking the side of the, um, the suffering. Well, thank you very much for this question. Uh, and I try to make clear the neutral or non neutral is not really my problem. I just want to give it down, but I really consider uh, uh, neutral. Now, as you mentioned, it may create <coughs> a, a problem if you uh, bear a witness against a certain part of uh, in the, in the conflict. You may not be admitted anymore to do something in the territory which is controlled by this group, uh, uh, etc. So <coughs> let me first uh, clarify what we meant by uh, uh, and then I will tell you uh, a few, I'll, I'll share a few critical thoughts about uh, uh, the, the, the human rights violations have to be massive and repeated for us to speak out, to go public and denounce was going on, and preferably, uh, and it is a very rare situation when we think precisely about them, uh, preferably we, we have to be the only ones capable of bearing witness. That means there's no journey, there's no uh, human rights groups, uh, etc. So under those very specific conditions, yes, we bear uh, a witness, and that was, <coughs> just to make things clear, that was an obsession of the founding fathers of NSA, an obsession which was also shared by the successors, which is one of them, uh, of, the, of the founders of NSA, about the, the, the history of the Red Cross in the concentration, the Nazi uh, concentration camps, and the silence of the Red Cross, uh, etc. So, having said that, uh, I, I was one of those who tried to give some theoretical grounds to the Manier, so I'm not uh, saying that I uh, now reject this, but stay, stepping back, taking from this, some distance from, from it, we can realize that the Manier was founded on a kind of huge misunderstanding. And this is about the Biafra War. Uh, you know, the Manier dates back to uh, those who stood up in Biafra with the French doctors, working for the Red Cross and said, well, we don't want to abide by the oath of, of silence uh, um, to uh, the, the, the Red Cross. We've got to denounce uh, a genocide which is ongoing, and we don't want to be accountable of this ongoing uh, massacre. Okay. <coughs> I found that when you, uh, at the time they say that, it was perfectly understandable, and uh, I think that, well, I was a young medical student at the time, but had I been in age of being in, in Europe, I think I would have shared the views of Kuchner and the others and stood up and, and, and denounced the, the, the genocide which, is, which was on both. Now, stating that, we can see that there is no such a thing as a genocide in Biafra. <coughs> it was a very cruel war, a secession war, a breakaway war, accounted by the counterinsurgency uh, war, and as we know, it was an internal uh, civil war, and as such, it was a very cruel uh, uh, thing. But this notion of genocide, which was perpetrated by the federal government, against the uh, breakaway group in the people <coughs> of the eastern Nigeria was a pure war propaganda invention. And uh, that was you know, what uh, strategists call a psychological war. Uh, in order to weaken what the adversary, then you kill him of the, the most cruel uh, thing, and you can uh, weaken uh, politically and then militarily. <coughs> The idea, of course, was that we needed to, I mean, there was a need that the uh, civilized country, the, the community of, of uh, nations bring its assistance to those who were on the brink of being exterminated. Uh, so that was a very important political asset for the, the Biafra, and this is the reason why they invented this notion of genocide, and the French uh, intelligence services uh, financed and, and expanded on, on uh, this notion of uh, genocide. Clarified, we know exactly how it happened, why, with what funds, uh, etc. So, uh, understanding that uh, bearing witness against the genocide can bend itself to a very cruel war propaganda, which 
in itself, from Trinity to the foundation of the, of the world, that is a very heavy responsibility. So that's it, it is what I have in mind when I think about bearing witness and the consequences that it, it, it is uh, uh, entails. So I will finish on saying that, in fact, the main lesson for me is the one we learned from the Ethiopian family in 84-85, where we realized that <coughs> The, all the, the, the resources that the uh, uh, aid industry was bringing into, the, 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 into Ethiopia in order to uh, alleviate the starvation of the, the people were used against the people uh, in such a way that they were forcibly relocated in the southern part of the country. And we found ourselves facing uh, this ultimate paradox <coughs> that the resources that were brought to the country in, in 85 were used in 84 were used in 85 to forcibly possibly relocate them in places of the country where they didn't want to go and that was the first cause of mortality. So aid was aid, aid was uh, killing the people it was supposed to save. That was the, the, the critical paradox. So and we had a very uh, strong and deep responsibility in this crime because we were part of the commission of the, of the crime. We were dead in, in the population trap, that is, we were attracting population, inspiring confidence to the people because as, as foreigners, we're supposed to be not tied by, by uh, the repression of the, the government, free, uh, um, the free speech. We are able to express ourselves as this is at least for the people thought. So we were very instrumental in attracting the population in, in uh, uh, holy camps or in, in uh, say, aid camps. And then uh, the, the tribes, the plains, the, 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 even the resources to, to move them, uh, to, to, to push them to, to, to move in, say, in certain places were used to deport them uh, in other places of the country. So we were directly involved in the commission of the mass, mass crime. And this is, for me, the, the, the the heart of the Thelonian, of the of the bearing witness, which is more an analytical position. It's not about what we see and the, uh, the atrocity that we can see with our own eyes. It's about a more general process which needs to be described in detail in order to make things clear and to, uh, to make the, the, the rest of the world understand that the solidarity effort can be turned into a, 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 a mass crime. Thanks, so that's the, that's the, 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 the comments. Thanks, Ronnie. Ramin, you also have sure. come up through the ranks of MSF. Sure. You live by their uh, teachings and yeah. uh, have inherited a lot of wisdom. But I know that you have strong ideas and opinions about a lot of the things that were said today, and sure. I'm hoping that you'll share some of them with us. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much. I was actually about to ask you, how do you see the creation of MSF either a reflection to reject some of the principles at the Biafra example or accepting some of them. And I think to some degree you answer that, well, maybe we come back to it. Uh, I wanted to say that, you know, I thank you very much for, um, for the talk and everybody else for contributing to that. Um, the important thing for me is that, you know, these principle, humanitarian principles, they're supposed to serve a purpose, and that purpose for me is to improve the humanitarian action and operations, because I think that's the most important purpose. And then when I look back to the history, I can't really come up with a lot of examples that actually these principles necessarily improve some form of the operational uh, humanitarian actions. There are some. But, uh, but I am not sure to what degree. And do we really have a good assessment or evidence that they are actually helpful, or they are some form of uh, empty promises in order to help us feel better? And uh, I truly believe that. I mean, I'm not saying necessarily, but I'm thinking that way. From the perspective of aid recipients, I can tell you that this principle could be meaningless and sometimes, sometimes very cruel. Here I'm serving a population, and you know they have been in a conflict between two groups, and their kids are dying. And I'm telling them I'm going to also be neutral and serve the other side. 
that sounds absolutely cruel because they see that other side as, as a reason for their misery. And the impartiality, how, how is it that you do not take my side? What else do I have to go through? And then independence, try to basically describe that you're not gonna get money from an alcohol industry, for example, or the US government in order to improve the health of my kids who are gonna die within 10 minutes. So that's the independence, financial independence. From the perspective of a recipient of, hey, this is really cruel. It does not make any sense, it's meaningless. For them is that get me whatever you can, and I don't care if it's dependent to any principle, yes or no. It goes back again to how much we're gonna really improve the humanitarian operation with sticking to this principle. I completely agree with you. I think in most of the scenarios, they are so controversial, they're almost impractical in many places, and then they become just like a regurgitation or a reflection and thought, and probably not gonna help us to really improve any form of operation on the ground, especially in the conflict and the war zone, so that's what I really think. And then I think we have this sense that these humanitarian principles are universal values. Like all of the people in the world, they're gonna really say, oh great, fantastic, neutrality is at the top of my priority in terms of principles, or impartiality. For God's sake, no. People are gonna be really more practical. They're gonna really actually see what's in front of them. Yes, I'm provocative, obviously, as you can see. And then, um, also I wanted to say that, um, just reflecting back on that, is that at the end of the day, I think, so I think at best these principles are aspirational. So when it comes at least to human rights or the rights, but then also, you know, I'm not gonna kind of drag this into discussion about international humanitarian rights or the rights and are they effective or not effective and you know, where's the efficacy and where the you know, reinforcement they should be or not, this is gonna be a long discussion. But I think they are at best aspirational and I think uh, in reality they're very empty and they really do not really uh, help us that much. <coughs> and I think, the, what else do I have to say? I think I'm gonna stop that. Oh, I wanna know, I wanna, yeah, so this is good. my question for you. <laughs> I don't know if that. So what do you think? Do you think the creation of MSF is out of us, this group of people, French journalists and doctors, reacting negatively towards some kind of a, this kind of humanitarian principles of trust and partiality and, um, and independence? Or it really comes out of that thinking? <clears throat> the, 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 the legion says that the <coughs> French doctors and went to the Red Cross in Biafra wanted to free themselves from the tutorship from the authority of the Red Cross and create a, create a, a group where a free speech would be ruled and uh, uh, etc. Um, when you look at what was written at the time, when you listen to those who were uh, deeply involved uh, in, this, in this process, something, you, you see something uh, different. Uh, they wanted, I mean, their idea <coughs> was to create uh, emergency medicine, a, a group which was specialized in emergency medicine. Let's recall that this is the, this is the first time of real emergency medicine in France, that is the creation of the SAMU, and by the way, the SAMU service that is the uh, Before that, there was no real emergency medicine, except in armies, uh, real emergency medicine was uh, created World War II, the Vietnam, Algeria, uh, uh, etc. But the, in uh, <coughs> civil medicine, there was no such thing as uh, emergency uh, medicine. So that was the time of the creation of emergency medicine. And several doctors who participated and contributed to the to the, the creation of the SAMU in Paris and in other places in, in France were founders of uh, uh, MSF. So there was this common ground of, uh, of idea. But the, the best idea they had was to create something which seemed just self-evident now, but it's, it seems self-evident because it was a very good idea, but we took time to be implemented and to be accepted, but to create a, a humanitarian group specialized in medical care. Mm -hmm. Because until then, uh, humanitarian organization were multi-purpose organizations, so this single purpose uh, one, uh, was a, now, as for, for Temoyer, Temoyer was not at play. It was, a, it was added to the creation of NSF years after the creation of NSF and then merged into the creation, but that was, this is an ex post uh, decision. 
Thanks, Ronnie. Um, we had wanted to give an opportunity to the people to ask um, some questions. I'm afraid we're running a little bit over, but uh, if there are any short questions and short answers, I know it's a tall order. I have to get a friend person to give a short answer, a lawyer to give a short answer, <laughs> Ronnie to give a short answer. It's not going to be very easy. Yes? Um, I'm just following up to what you were mentioning regarding the independence principle. Um, my name is Laura Nierenbinder. I was a field nurse at NSF for years before becoming a full-time mom. But I can say when you spoke to the independence and you said from the beneficiary perspective, maybe it doesn't matter to them or not. Conversely, my experience in the field, for example, when I went to chat and I um, went to the board with the job, to do an assessment, because we, as an MSF team, had independence, when we saw that um, people were drinking out of uh, the riverbed and people needed immediate intervention, we had that independence to act and help that population. I think that population was happy to see that. We didn't have to go back and ask permission from the donor. May we make this intervention, a big public health intervention to prevent cholera, we can act right now. So just to clarify for the audience, I think having the independent money that choice does make a really big difference in our best Thanks, Laura. Can I ask a Sure, Ronnie, go ahead. Sure, Ronnie, go ahead. I fully agree, it's not just to persuade him to do it. Independence is, um, is key to start and to end a problem. To start it at the right time when it's needed and to stop it uh, if there is a need because it's being influenced and I'm totally against the population. That is the midst, the midst between the end of the, between the beginning and the end, independent doesn't make too much sense. Thanks, Johnny. I think um, we have reached the end of our time. There's no other um, burning questions. And I'd like to thank you, thank the panel. Thank you, especially, Ryan, for your thank you for having me. comments. Really appreciate it. And certainly uh, thank. Um, greatly Richard and Janet Southby for their generosity in sponsoring uh, this lecture series and today's event in particular. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming.